is kind of around. I'm just very curious. I'm working on it. I got a lot of prescriptions to go through. <laughs> yeah, I have you guys doing three a piece, and then I have oh, no, other students no. doing three a piece. Yeah, so it's quite a few. So I feel like I'm working at Walgreens. <laughs> you know? Trying to decipher what people want. Just do them as they come in, you know. So it's uh, it's, it's tough because again, I don't want to just sit there and be like, wrong, wrong, wrong. You know, I just want I just want to like go through and give comments, you know, because. Yeah, I could go if they're right, right, right. Then I'm right, 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 right. You know. Um, however, I like to give kind of customized feedback so you guys know kind of know what you're doing. Yeah, and and one of the things that it's a good point I think to to mention is that like you're doing it my way right now, right? Like you're doing it the stock standard. You mean all the legal requirements? This is how a pharmacist would like to see a prescription come through. Does that mean that's how you're always going to do it? Not necessarily, right? So again, I'm being more stringent on you guys, more strict, so that way you know kind of what the top level is. And then, you know, when you're actually out there in practice, you'll see how it differs, right? Not to say that one's wrong or one's, uh, you know, better than the other. It's just this is how we do it, right? You know, so and, and once you kind of get used to like certain pharmacies you work with pretty consistently, you know, they'll say like, okay, well, you know, I know if I'm uh, sending this type of script, I need to do this, this, and this to make it correct. That'll change, you know. So and, and most of you guys will never write a handwritten prescription in your, in your careers, right? Most of you will do EMR. Um, and you'll never have to think about it. They kind of do the majority of that stuff for you. So again, um, having you handwrite it because you need the experience, you need to kind of know what the top level is. And then if it comes down in rotations, that's fine. You know, so again, this is this is just kind of my, my perspective on it. And again, I'm working on it, so I'll well, get to you guys. You. No, no, no. Again, quality takes time, you know. Uh, <laughs> All right, anyway, so let's uh, finish up with Indo, and then we'll go into um, talking about OB-GYN uh, concerns. You guys already started OB-GYN? I saw some slides up here, so I imagine you have. Okay. All right, so we talked about type 1 diabetes. We talked about our types of insulin we're going to use for a type 1 diabetic. Again, those same characteristics of insulin carry over into your type 2 diabetic, right? It's just a matter of when we start um, insulin for a type 2 diabetic, because it's usually later or earlier. Usually later, right? Because again, you want to hold off on having to use insulin for a type 2 diabetic as long as you can. There's lots of side effects. There's hypoglycemia. There's weight gain. Um, you know, it's, it's cumbersome for the patient. They're injecting themselves. They don't like to do that. If we can use oral medications, that's going to be beneficial for them, right? Not going to get specific into treatment goals, but just know we're looking at both things like their postprandial uh, glucose. We're looking at their fasting glucose, A1C. These are things we're going to be shooting for, and it differs based on the organization you're, you're talking about. Um, but when you're working with these patients, you kind of find out what your standard is and what your goals are going to be shooting for. Anyway, so typically what we do for type 2 diabetic, when they get diagnosed, right, um, they're going to try to initiate lifestyle changes. What could those, some of those be? Exercise. Diet, usually kind of uh, try to limit the amount of carb intake. Obviously, you don't want to cut out all carbs completely, right? But, you know, they need to make sure they're doing everything in moderation, right? <laughs> lifestyle changes are important. Now, how many people do you think actually get to their actual goals with just lifestyle modification? generally not very many, right? Again, it's going to be a useful adjunct, but a lot of people don't, again, they've been doing these kind of bad habits for a good long time. It's a hard time for, it's difficult for them to change all of those. So what we have to move on to is using uh, oral therapy, and this is going to be usually monotherapy using one drug at first, and then potentially using combination therapy with multiple oral agents. And then finally, we'll talk about um, combination therapy, usually oral agents with insulin. Now it is, we have a few more um, uh, injectable products, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, but this is kind of the main way uh, most of these patients will progress. And again, the time frame depends on, on the patient, how, how kind of progressive or progressive they already are by the time they get diagnosed, et cetera. So lots of different things will change with this. Okay, so again, looking at something like their plasma glucose levels, what you're going to notice is that, you know, uh, with a type 2 diabetic, you would imagine they would have the highest spikes in their blood glucose after a, a glucose challenge, right? So again, this is like meal time. This is where you see the glucose rise. Um, IGT stands for, anyone know what that stands for? Yeah, impaired glucose tolerance. So that's someone who's already insulin resistant, but they're not really as far progressed as someone who would have true type 2 diabetes. So what do you also notice about the insulin that's being uh, secreted from these patients, right? So red's kind of the, the diabetic patient. Notice their levels a lot lower than what you would expect to see with someone who had normal functioning pancreas, someone without diabetes. What do you kind of notice about the, the yellow line, though? It stays up longer than you would see with a, um, with a normal glucose tolerant patient. Why do you think that is? Because those cells are so insensitive to insulin, like it takes more insulin around. Your pancreas is sending out more insulin in order to try to correct that blood glucose. It's sensing, you know, hey, the sugars are like 210. I need to get this down into a, a reasonable range. And so you have these higher levels going on. That's why you see they wear out their pancreas into a point where they have 
true type 2 diabetes, their levels aren't going to be the same as you would see. And I apologize for not using the laser pointer. I probably would make it more clear what I'm pointing at, right? Uh, anywho, um, but you'd see that you know, by the time they're type 2 diabetic, they have lost a lot of that function. They're they're getting to a point where they can't really secrete as much insulin, okay? So we're going to be targeting, this is going to be one of the main things we're going to target is to make our insulin work better or to try to secrete more, okay? There's some different ways we can do that. Um, other things you're going to find is that with a, a normal glucose tolerant patient that they're uh, when they around meal time you notice they get a big spike in insulin but that typically goes down versus a type 2 diabetic they can't really get that same spike the other big thing is glucagon normally glucagon does what raise yeah gluconeogenesis raises blood sugar right normally if you have a meal what should that do to glucagon levels should suppress them, right? What you end up finding with these type 2 diabetic patients is they don't get that same level of suppression. So they have higher glucagon levels. And so what's that going to do to blood sugar? Raises it up, right? So again, they kind of have two problems there where they're not having enough insulin and they're having too much glucagon around. So we're going to find that there's some agents we can actually use to try to um, uh, get that glucagon level down to try to get the sugars back into control, okay? Okay, so a couple of different uh, uh, drugs we have here, and I apologize if things didn't line up like they should have, but we'll, we'll talk about these uh, in detail. So we're going to have drugs that stimulate the pancreas to make more insulin. These are going to be our sulfonylureas, and there's another class called maglitinides. We're going to talk about drugs that sensitize the body to insulin, and so this can include our thiazolidinediones. You can just say TZD. It's a lot easier. And also our biguanides is where metformin is going to come into play. Um, we're going to have things that slow the absorption of starches in the, in the GI tract. So those will be our alpha glucosidase inhibitors. And then we're going to have things that suppress glucagon. They're going to suppress gastric emptying and also suppressing food intake. And these are going to be our incretin memetics. Okay, we'll look at those in a minute. And then the newest class we actually have, and I apologize, this should be even farther down, is that uh, we have drugs that decrease reabsorption of glucose from the renal tubules. So again, if you decrease reabsorption, what's going to happen? Pee it straight out and right, and so that helps to drive down the glucose levels as well. So those are the main classes that we're going to talk about. And then again, if they were not being able to be uh, well controlled on just these drugs, that's when you move on to insulin. Kind of giving a, a good comparison of some of the different classes. You can see here that their fasting plasma glucose levels um, will have different ranges based on the type of drug. Some uh, are going to have, be more potent. Some are going to be less potent. It just depends. And you can typically see a normal percentage reduction in, in their A1C. Um, anyone know kind of a rule of thumb? If you uh, increase or decrease your A1C by one point, what that means for actual uh, average glucose concentrations? Yeah, usually around like 35, 30 to 35 or so, um, average is level uh, down or, or above, right? So by changing that one point, usually change it by 35 milligrams per deciliter of, of glucose. So a little rule of thumb there. Anywho, so our sulfonylurea is the, the uh, four main ones I want you to memorize here are going to be the ones in bold. So again, we have a first generation agents uh, that includes chlorpropamide, and then there's our second generation. These are used a lot more frequently, uh, but this includes glomepiride, glipizide, and glyburide. Okay, so you think like G drugs. With diabetes, you're thinking of uh, sulfonylureas. And so if you go back and you uh, remember how we said that normally insulin is secreted from the pancreas, remember that we had those potassium channels that would close up and they would cause a depolarization of that beta cell. When you have that depolarization, that's going to let in what ion? Calcium is going to come in. Calcium comes in and that's going to go ahead and cause those vesicles uh, to go to the cell surface and they'll undergo exocytosis and then boom, you have insulin being released into the bloodstream. Same thing's happening here, but the sulfonylureas are directly blocking those potassium channels. So basically they're going to come in, they'll block this, that's going to lead to that um, uh, membrane to depolarize and thus you're going to have calcium come in, insulin gets released. So these are going to be directly stimulating insulin release. They will directly increase insulin levels. So what do you think side effects are going to be? Hypoglycemia, what's the other big thing you see with, di uh, with insulin? Weight gain, right? So again, these are going to be very similar things. Keep in mind, these only work for a patient that actually has the ability to secrete insulin. So these might be good for like a starting out a diabetic patient, but you may see that it will lose efficacy over time as the pancreas gets worn out, right? Um, so do you think this would work for a type 1 diabetic patient? Right, because again, they don't have those beta cells really to release insulin in the first place, okay? So um, again, we're going to find that... Um, the biggest thing is just watch for renal hepatic insufficiency because they will be kind of handled by both organs um, based on what you're using there. Um, and again, uh, not something we're going to use a lot for uh, our pregnant patients. Uh, we we'll, won't talk about too much uh, of about gestational diabetes, um, but does anyone know what you typically use for like a pregnant patient with diabetes? Usually we just go to insulin, right? Because if we can't do it with dietary modification, we typically just do insulin because it's we're close to the most natural product we can give that patient uh, without having to kind of give them uh, some of these synthetic chemicals like, you know, sulfonylureas and, and other things. 
Anywho, um, you're going to find you got to be careful in the elderly. This is definitely uh, one of those classes of drugs that shows up on the beers list, right? And you guys are familiar with that beers list? Again, um, there's going to be those things that you want to be careful of in giving in elderly patients because it can cause, you know, altered mental status, falls, things like that. And again, some of these drugs have very long half-lives. So again, the longer they stick around, more likely you are to see things like hypoglycemia. That can be an issue there. And so typically chlorpropamide and glyburide, those are the two biggest ones that will cause hypoglycemia out of the bunch. Okay. So, um, and again, there may be some activity to kind of increase sensitivity at the peripheral tissue, but the main thing is doing is going to be increasing uh, the amount of insulin being released. And so potentially you can give this along with insulin, and that would actually decrease the total amount of insulin you'd have to give those patients. But it's kind of more rare that I would see these two combined in, in a lot of cases. But very good at having uh, rapid glucose control. Um, but again, the flip side of that, the double-edged sword, is you can't see hypoglycemia. Um, usually we're going to use uh, something that has a more kind of long-acting formulation. So I see a lot of Glucotrol XL uh, with glipizide uh, in it uh, being used pretty frequently for these patients. It's kind of interesting. that It's actually a tablet that's actually plastic and has a little tiny hole drilled right into the middle of it. So if you ever get a chance to see one of these tablets, it's kind of interesting. It has a little tiny hole, and basically when it goes into the GI tract, osmotic pressure will push the drug out over a long period of time. So you get 24-hour coverage. But the flip side of that is where do you think the tablet ends up at the end of the day? going to be in the feces, right? Because again, you don't, you don't absorb that, that plastic. So again, the ta uh, patients may say, well, hey, I found this tablet that's in my, in my stool. And say, hey, that's totally normal. That's what you expect to see with, with this particular drug, right? Anyway. So again, adverse effects, hypoglycemia and weight gain are the biggest things. Um, other than that, pretty rare to see many of these other side effects, but you could see, you know, um, some, some blood dyscrasias, but pretty rare. And again, resistance develops over time because again, as you wear out the pancreas more, you're going to find that's going to be uh, less likely to release insulin. So, um, so finding reasons to be contraindicated if you had someone who like DKA, because again, we said DKA, their ultimate problem is what? Yeah, they're insulin deficient, right? So again, um, this is not going to fix that, so I would not give this uh, in that in situation. Uh, would not give this in type 1 diabetic patients or use it in pregnant patients. So again, um, just know the contraindications there. Um, big things you might see with drug interactions is, again, if you're giving it with uh, something that's going to raise blood sugar, it's going to decrease the efficacy of this drug. If you give it with something else that's going to drop blood sugar, you're going to be more likely to see hypoglycemia. So you got to be careful with that. And then there's also some protein-binding interactions where something could come along and kick it off of the protein, and you can see more hypoglycemic effects. So just watch for those. Again, run it through your interaction checker before you start a new med just to see what's out there, right? And then you guys remember those disulfiram reactions you can see? Or what that is? Or any other antibiotics that cause that? So you guys probably aren't uh, drinkers, which is a good thing, right? So again, you're going to keep all the toxins out, but some of your patients might be. So this would be one of those things where we would not want to consume with alcohol because it would actually blocks some of the breakdown of uh, some of the toxic metabolites of alcohol. So you guys remember flagell? Talk about you don't want to drink with flagell or metronidazole because you see a disulfiram reaction. get very flush, very hot. They can throw up, you know. Um, so again, that's one of those things we would uh, want to be careful of and not mix it with alcohol. And again, alcohol can have the propensity to potentially make you hyperglycemic depending on, um, you know, how sugary the, the drink is you're consuming with. Or you can actually deplete glucose as well. So in some cases, you can find alcohol causing hypoglycemia. So anyway. Very similar to the sulfonylureas, there are going to be the maglitinides. Um, these are not used very frequently, but they're still worth mentioning here in case you see it. There's rapaglinide and ateglinide. Basically, what they're going to do is the same mechanism as uh, the sulfonylureas. The only difference is that they are very mealtime dependent. I mean, they need to have that extra kind of bolus of glucose coming in from the uh, GI tract in order to actually stimulate insulin release. So again, you'd be less likely to see hypoglycemia with these drugs because they don't really work any other time than around meal time. That also means they're gonna be less effective overall than you'd see with your sulfonylureas. So again, not used frequently, but maybe occasionally be used out there. Um, depending if a patient maybe did not do well with the sulfonylureas, might be better for them. But again, um, they need to take it, you know, around, you know, one hour, maybe 30 minutes before a meal time in order to make sure that it's kind of uh, in the system. And when that glucose comes in from the meal, it can kind of stimulate the uh, insulin release, right? Because again, we saw in that chart that insulin release was kind of, uh, was, uh, kind of blunted in those type 2 diabetic patients, right? So we're trying to help to stimulate that to be more similar to what a normal patient would be, right? Um, again, if you miss a dose uh, or skip a meal, just go ahead and skip a dose at that point because, again, it really won't be that effective. Again, very similar side effects you're going to see with um, hypoglycemia weight gain being the biggest ones.
Okay, this is a big group here. Uh, it's going to be the biguanides, and big not necessarily in the number of uh, drugs we have available, but more big in the sense that we have, uh, this is going to be a mainstay of therapy. So this is where metformin comes into play. Everyone's heard of metformin before, the glucophage, right? So again, this is typically the first drug you're going to start the probably 99% of these patients out on, right? It's a very, very good drug because it doesn't actually stimulate insulin release, but what it's going to do is help to sensitize our body to the effects of insulin. So all that insulin we're going to be sending out, it's going to work better for us uh, than it would otherwise because it does things like decreases hepatic glucose production, right? It's going to increase that peripheral glucose uptake, and it's going to be able to make it more uh, well utilized. And you're going to see less glucose being absorbed from the GI tract, right? So we call this an insulin sensitizer because it's going to make our insulin work better, right? So it's a very good drug. It actually does not really cause any hypoglycemia for the most part, which is another benefit. And actually, if anything, you might see a little bit of weight loss with this drug, probably either weight neutral or a little bit of weight loss. So that's good uh, for a lot of your diabetic patients because typically they tend to be overweight, right? So it can be a good thing there. So um, one of the things to watch out for is you got to be really careful with using metformin in patients with renal disease. There's actually some cutoffs to where uh, if they have a certain um, a creatinine clearance, you do not want to use metformin. The problem with that is, is if you have metformin stick around for too long, you end up finding you can have uh, a lactic acidosis that develops, right? Lactic acidosis is not good for the body, and for these patients who cannot clear lactic acid because they probably have bad kidneys anyway, this is where they can run into some issues, and there's been deaths associated with this. So again, uh, it's one of those things where you want to be really careful. They have a uh, history of kidney disease. This is not going to be a good drug for them, right? So um, the other big side effects you're going to see with this is a lot of GI upset. So again, um, you can mitigate that by either taking this with meals or you might use like an extended release preparation. That, um, that way it kind of has a slower release throughout the day. Um, but you're going to see a lot of GI upset, a lot of, um, especially as you drive the doses higher and higher because you can get some pretty big doses with this. So just be careful with that. Um, the other big thing is that typically if you have a patient go into the hospital or say they're going for like a CT scan or they're going to surgery, you typically want to stop the metformin because you can have some issues of kind of um, transient uh, renal uh, issues that can happen there. You're going to see some transient renal um, uh, you know, decrease in, in activity. And so that way you can actually build up levels of metformin, see that lactic acidosis. So you want to be careful with that. Typically we'll stop, stop it for 48 hours uh, and then you can restart it afterwards. Yes. So you're talking about like the contrast you're doing? Yeah, so if you're doing a CT scan with contrast, obviously if it was without contrast, it wouldn't really matter. But the, the, the contrast itself can be nephrotoxic. So it's one of those things where if they already kind of had bad kidneys to begin with and then they add on a nephrotoxin with the CT, uh, the, uh, the dye, and then you mix that with the metformin, that's when you run into issues. Yeah. And it can be an issue, too, because if you have a patient who comes in to the hospital, to the ER, uh, and they need a stat CT scan with, with a contrast, and they happen to be on metformin, you can't really do a whole lot about that. So a lot of times they just try to tank them up with lots of fluids and try to mitigate that as best they can. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Usually 24 to 48 or so. Once you kind of get back in their kind of back of their baseline, then you can start it back up for them. And again, this isn't going to be one of those things where um, you know if they're in the inpatient side, if you have to stop them on their metformin, what do you do for their sugar at that point? Typically, you just put them on insulin, right? Typically, you put them on like on a sliding scale insulin while they're in the hospital, and then you can get them set back up on their normal meds afterwards. Yeah. So again, typically, it'll be one of those things where they'll measure their glucose at, at meal time and at bedtime, and then they'll give them a, a certain dose based on, um, you know, based on insulin sensitivity, et cetera. So that's usually what we end up doing. So um, we used to do it based on serum creatinine value, but nowadays we just say if their GFR is less than 30, don't use metformin, right? Um, so that's pretty significant renal um, uh, dim dimension activity there. So again, just go ahead and, and, and avoid that if you have the creatinine clearance of that low. Um, Anyone with hepatic disease, they are also going to be more likely to develop that lactic acidosis, so be careful in using it there uh, as well. Um, and again, I mentioned stop for surgery. Usually withhold about 48 hours or so, because again, during surgery, you can actually see increase in lactic acid as well. So again, just watch out for that. Okay, I'll talk about how we're going to use these specifically in these patients a little bit later, but I just want to get all the drug classes out of the way now. Um, next, we have the TZDs or the thiazolidinediones. Again, it's hard to say, so just TCD is fine. Um, but these are going to be the glitazones. We have pioglitazone and rosiglitazone. There's another one that got removed for liver toxicity. So these are the two big ones we're going to use here. Basically, the mechanism is these are also going to be insulin sensitizers, but it's a different mechanism than what you see with metformin. Basically, what they're going to do is they're going to be this agonist for this peroxisome proliferator, uh, proliferator activated receptor gamma, or PPAR gamma. Again, 
the main thing I want you guys to know is it's going to be insulin sensitizer, but it works differently than metformin, right? So again, by working through this PPAR gamma, um, this helps to change transcription of some of these insulin sensitive genes. And so by doing that, you're going to have better activity of insulin. So it would be okay if you wanted to make something like metformin plus one of these TZDs because they have uh, complementary mechanisms of action, right? It wouldn't be one of those things where it wouldn't make sense to add them together because they did the same thing, right? So again, if I had a question where it's like, well, you know, could I make something like glipizide with nateglinide? And you say, well, no, they're doing the same exact thing. It really wouldn't make a whole lot of extra sense. However, metformin plus a TZD may be okay, right? So again, it just depends on the mechanism. Make sure you're looking for complementary things. This is kind of similar to when we were treating hyperlipidemia, where you could use a statin, but then you may need to add on something else. You want to add on something that's going to be complementary, like, uh, you know, a fibrate, or you want to add on something like niacin or something like that, right? So same, same concept. Anyway, basically what you end up seeing is you get pretty uh, good increase in glucose uptake in the peripheral tissues. Um, you're going to see, um, and this should actually say uh, glucose production, I apologize, uh, but you're going to have decreased hepatic glucose production. Liver usually doesn't make insulin. It's got something really wrong going on. But anywho, um, and again, these are going to take a little bit of time to kick in, usually about 6 to 12 weeks before you really see kind of full effects for these drugs. Right. Okay, now the big thing to watch out for is this is not going to be good for CHF patients because you can end up seeing um, expanded blood volume, they can develop edema, and so they already had issues with uh, venous distension uh, or venous uh, overflow to begin with. This can exacerbate that. So this is one, is one I would avoid in CHF patients. Other things you might see, a little bit of weight gain, but not, um, not as much as you would see with like a sulfonylurea, um, maybe some myalgias. Those are the big things. And then just watch for their liver enzymes. Usually you'll do like every two months for the first year or so, and then you can kind of extend that out. Uh, obviously if their ALT, or their ASC kind of goes above three times that upper limit of normal, then you'd go ahead and DC that at that point. All right, so just watch for um, liver stuff. Okay, now rosiglitazone has kind of a bad name associated with it, so you may not see it being used very much anymore because there are some studies that show that it may have an increase in cardiovascular death associated with them. And so people weren't sure if it was a class effect or not, so you really don't see as many of the glitazones being used as they used to, but just know that they're still out there. You may see them used occasionally. Typically, pioglitazone um, gets a lot more use. You can just think rosiglitazone isn't so rosy in its activity, so may cause people to die. The other thing of that one um, is not being used quite so much anymore. So again, I'm not going to get into the studies. But just know, increased risk of cardiovascular death, and that's why they don't really use rosiglitazone much anymore. Okay. Next class are going to be the alpha gluc glucosidase inhibitors. And so these are going to be um, drugs that basically prevent the starches that are coming through your GI tract from being absorbed. Uh, by inhibiting this enzyme alpha glucosidase. So we have two here. We have acarbose and miglitol. And basically by acting as a competitive antagonist for the uh, alpha amylase and alpha glucosidase, you prevent those big sugars from being broken down into smaller, more absorbable particles, right? Because again, usually sugars that are big, long chains, they don't get absorbed that GI tract very well. They have to be broken down by these enzymes. So if you don't have that, you're going to have them stick around the GI tract. What do you think happens to all those sugars? You're sitting there in the GI tract. What else is kind of living in your GI tract? Bacteria, right? And what do bacteria like to eat? Sugar. What do they produce as a byproduct? Protein. Maybe some protein. Also produce gas. They're going to produce gas, right? So again, this is going to be one of the big side effects you're going to see with this. This is a good set of drugs for patients who you do not want to have systemic absorption. So for instance, if you had like, you know, children potentially, or maybe pregnant women, this is one that may be a better class to use. However, the side effects are pretty, uh, pretty gnarly. GI standpoint. So because all of that, um, all the sugars don't get absorbed, you're going to see a lot of gas production, you're going to see a lot of flatulence, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, eructation. Anyone know what eructation is? It's burping you see along with that, so it's kind of a fancy word for burping. Um, uh, anyone know the, the, uh, the medical term for the grumblies and the tumblies? Borborygmus. Yeah, that's always a fun word uh, I learned in school. Uh, anywho, um, these are going to be better though, and when do you need to take them uh, in regards to meals, do you think? Probably around mealtime, right? Because these are only going to work when you have all those sugars in the GI tract. So this is very similar to the um, glutenides. You wouldn't want to take these around mealtime. That's where you're going to need the most efficacy there. And again, if you skip a meal, just go ahead and skip the doses as well because you really won't have much benefit there. And again, usually not a first-line agent. Usually going to be added on in addition to um, uh, something else like metformin or, or some other drug. And again, for the most part, most of your patients will start off on metformin alone, and then you would add on stuff from there. Okay, so you get a lot of abdominal pain, a lot of diarrhea, flatulence, just due to those undigested carbohydrates there. So that's the main thing you're going to run into. Um, obviously, you want to uh, not use this in patients who already have maybe inflammatory bowel disease, so like a Crohn's patient, you see, uh, would not want to do that because, again, that can lead to kind of worsened inflammation there. Okay. 
So the next group of drugs, this is kind of the newer class of drugs we're using nowadays. These are going to be called the incretin mimetics. And so incretin is a hormone that you release. And basically what you would see is that, um, say for instance, you were giving uh, a patient, uh, you had two patients, you're giving one an oral glucose challenge and one you're giving an IV glucose challenge, right? So you're going to find there's different hormones that get stimulated based on what's coming through the GI tract versus if it's just being introduced into the, into the bloodstream. So for instance, like, you know, if I gave you an IV bolus of dextrose, what do you think it does to insulin secretion? should go up, right? Because again, the pancreas detects there's extra glucose. It's going to be uh, respond to that by increasing uh, insulin release. Not all these hormones work that way. So for instance, if I have, uh, say, this intravenous IV glucose, there's this hormone incretin. Um, you see it doesn't really get that stimulated when I give a, uh, the product IV versus if I give the dextrose oral. You're going to see that it gets very well stimulated there. This is going to be important because what you're going to find for these type 2 diabetic patients is they do not get the same release of this uh, hormone as you would see with a normal glucose tolerant patient. So basically, the big incretin we're going to be focusing on here is called glucagon-like peptide 1. They don't let the name fool you. It does not act the same as glucagon. If anything, it's going to actually help to drive down blood glucose levels, right? Um, so what you're going to find, it gets stimulated after uh, mealtime glucose influx, right? So usually if your blood sugar raises above 90 milligrams per deciliter, you're going to start to see increase in release of glucagon-like peptide, or GLP-1 is the other way that gets uh, abbreviated there. And so we're going to get released from the intestine. Um, you're going to find that you'll have increased glucose-dependent insulin release from the pancreas, which means as GLP-1 levels rise, that will stimulate insulin release coming from the pancreas, which is a good thing, and, you know, after, after meal time. Um, and you're also going to find it decreases gastric emptying and uh, decreases food intake. Why might this be beneficial? They feel fuller, right, because, again, their stomach is staying fuller for longer. And then also it's going to increase, uh, what's the term for feeling full? Satiety, right? So it gets, it's going to increase satiety. So what do you think might be a side effect from this? We're going to see some weight loss, right? So these are actually some of these drugs we're going to use here um, are actually have off-label uses specifically for weight loss. And so they're going to be very, very powerful weight loss agents uh, from that standpoint. Anyway, so they're going to be good from, from that standpoint. You're going to find that they um, also are going to get metabolized by this enzyme called dipeptidyl peptidase 4 or DPP4. This is only being mentioned here because we have several drugs that actually interact with that specifically. Okay, we'll talk about it in a second here. So, again, GLP-1 gets uh, secreted upon ingestion of food, so it doesn't really work, uh, have a lot of stimulation from, like, IV administration of, of dextrose. However, what you're going to find, you're going to have decreased glucagon secretion, you're going to have increased insulin secretion, and the brain's going to feel full, right? They're going to stop eating, hopefully, because they feel full. They don't really have that urge to eat any further. So... Um, as I mentioned, typically type 2 diabetics not only have a decreased level of insulin, but they're also going to have a decreased level of GLP-1-induced um, insulin secretion as well. So again, GLP-1 is not as active, so oftentimes what we're going to do is try to give them a replacement or prevent breakdown of what they're already producing to begin with, right? So we've either tried to inhibit that DPP-4 or try to give them a replacement GLP agonist, okay? So again, uh, these are going to be very good, uh, again, from uh, uh, lots of standpoint, because they're going to decrease glucagon, increase insulin, and the patient feels full of water, right? So if they're not taking in as much dextrose, guess what? They're not going to have their blood sugar rise quite as high as it would have otherwise, right? Okay. Again, just showing some pictures here. No, normally, with a type 2 diabetic, that glucagon level stays high for longer. And again, a lot of that has to go back to that GLP-1 not really being as active for a type 2 diabetic patient. Okay, and then looking at release of GLP-1 uh, in diabetic patients, so normal glucose tolerant patient you can see here, uh, right around breakfast time, should have a lot of good carbohydrates coming in. You can see levels rise pretty significantly here, but it's going to be much more diminished in someone with type 2 diabetes, right? So if we can get something that can either replace that or can prevent breakdown of it, that's going to be beneficial for them, right? Okay, so we're going to start with our incretin mimetics. These are going to be drugs that directly um, replace the activity of GLP-1 by being agonists at those receptors, okay? Anyone know what this is? The Gila monster. Anyone know why I put a picture of a Gila monster? It actually is very similar to the saliva of a Gila monster. So again, I have no idea what these scientists are doing where they find out that the saliva of a Gila monster has very similar homology in as far as the amino acid sequence of our GLP-1. No idea why that is. I don't know why they, uh, uh, they developed that, but that is what it is. So again, uh, basically they derive it from the uh, saliva here. And about 53% homology with GLP-1, meaning the amino acid sequence is over half uh, identical to the saliva there from the Gila monster. 
So this drug is called exenatide, or Bieta is the brain. This is the first incretinimumatic that came out. And so basically what you would do is you would add this on top of something like metformin. It's not usually a first-line agent, but you may add it on to something like metformin typically, or like a sulfonylurea or something. And so basically these are proteins, so how do you think they might have to be administered? Sub Q, right? So again, um, these need to be sub Q. Did I give you Victoza or Loraglutide for your prescription assignment? Yep. So, um, right, so that, this is going to be one of those type of drugs, right, as you saw. So they have to be injectable based products, essentially. And so usually um, they'll do it around mealtimes, uh, and they'll have usually a pre filled pen. They just kind of dial in the dose they're going to administer, and they have to give that to themselves. This one wasn't. wasn't um, it's not really a preferred one nowadays because we have ones that have a longer duration of action because this one has to be given twice daily. So again, having more injections is usually not a good thing for, for most patients. But this was the first one we had. So um, again, looking at uh, if you were to give someone exenatide uh, versus um, looking at just placebo, you can see here that with a type 2 diabetic patient, you can see the, the levels here, their insulin look very similar to what you would see with a normal um, normal patient. So again, we're replacing all that GLP-1 that they're not producing themselves, and this helps to really uh, increase that insulin secretion. So it's a really good thing. It really helps to kind of get their blood sugars back down under control. So adverse effects, you're going to see nausea vomiting being a potential, especially uh, due to that delayed gastric emptying. So there's something that's very full that has potential to come up. Um, typically, it doesn't cause a lot of hypoglycemia, but it could potentially if you have it on top of a sulfonylurea, because again, they can have a little bit of synergies in there. And then uh, maybe some uh, delayed absorption of oral medications, but again, not usually a clinical concern here. But the big thing is going to be weight loss, right? So again, that it can be a good thing for some patients. Most patients can be a good thing. In fact, I remember I had one of my uh, uncles got started on uh, loraglutide or Victoza, and I remember he just, you know, I remember I probably didn't see him for like a six-month period. So early on, pretty big dude. Anyone ever familiar with like Wilford Brimley? Yes, his diabetes on TV. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah, that guy. So he looked kind of like that dude. And then all of a sudden he got put on Victoza and I saw him like six months later and he looked like, a, you know, thin as a rail basically. And so I was just like, oh, what happened? He's like, started this drug and I don't want to eat anymore. Good to a point, but then to a point where he was getting actually malnourished. Okay. And so they actually had to uh, decrease his dose and get him kind of back onto where he's actually having some hunger. Um, but again, it can be kind of a double-edged sword, but usually beneficial for most patients. And a lot of off-label use is uh, starting to come up where they're using it for, for weight loss. And then pancreatitis is another big thing, again, because it's uh, helping to stimulate the pancreas, you can potentially see that, so w watch out for that. Okay, so some other ones we have nowadays are going to be loraglutide or Victoza, we're going to have dulaglutide or Trulicity, and there's albiglutide or Tanzium. And again, um, some of these are very nice because they can be administered less frequently, so the less often I have to inject these things, the better off I'm going to be for compliance sakes. Um, so for instance, like uh, Victoza has to be given every single day, as you saw on, on your prescription, you guys did, right? Hopefully everyone did daily dosing. Okay. Um, but some of these can be administered uh, administer just once weekly, which is going to be much better for a compliance standpoint. So uh, additional benefit there. Okay, so we can replace GLP-1, but we can also prevent the breakdown. And this is where we have our DPP-4 inhibitors, right? And so this is where we're going to have um, uh, things that are going to, uh, this is where, uh, these are also going to be oral agents. So again, this is one benefit over the GLP-1 agonists is they're not injectables. So it could be beneficial if you have a patient who's like pretty needle phobic and didn't want to start an injectable product just yet. The main ones we're going to have here are going to be our alagliptin, citagliptin, saxagliptin, and linagliptin. And so Genuvia is probably the first one out of this group, and so probably people have seen commercials for that before, but um, that was a pretty big one when it first came out. And again, these came out uh, before the GLP-1 agonists did. So these were kind of a big uh, deal for a long time, but now they're kind of taking a little bit of a backseat to those GLP-1 agonists. But they're still pretty good drugs for the most part. You typically will not see as much weight loss with these as you do with the GLP-1 agonists, okay? Because again, these are only going to enhance whatever GLP-1 the actual patient is secreting their own on their own. Um, this does not replace any of that. It just helps it to stick around for a little bit longer. So not nearly as potent effects on, on weight there. And then uh, the other big thing you can see is some uh, anaphylaxis here, but uh, some skin rash. So it can potentially progress to Stevens Johnson. It's pretty rare, but can happen. Okay. So again, just looking at um, utilizing the uh, you know citagliptin by itself, you can see a pretty decent reduction in their A1C. You know, anywhere between like 0.5 to 1 is considered pretty significant, I would say. Um, but again, these are very good uh, in working in synergy with other. Um, uh, anti-diabetic medications. So if they had metformin on board, you can see a lot uh, bigger decrease in their A1C there. So again, combination therapy is going to be required for a lot of these patients. And so what's one way you can kind of increase compliance when you're having to use multiple meds for these uh, patients? You combine them into one. So you see a lot of uh, combination drugs for diabetes with metformin in addition to something else, right? So if you ever see like something met 
um, or meta something that's usually going to be metformin with something else uh, in, in along with it, either sulfonylurea or one of these um, DPP4 inhibitors or something else um, uh, to try to increase compliance. Okay, so again, just looking at a comparison between the GLP-1 agonists versus the DPP-4 inhibitors, again, the biggest differences you're going to find here is that GLP-1 agonists tend to be more potent at getting blood sugar under control, um, but you're also going to find there's going to be more weight loss along with that. Um, however, the DPP-4 inhibitors are going to be oral. That's kind of the main benefit with that one. Okay, As far as main side effects to watch out for, pancreatitis with the GLP-1 agonists, Stevens-Johnson's with the DPP-4 inhibitors. Okay. All right, the last group of drugs we're going to look at here for um, uh, diabetes is going to be our sodium glucose cotransporter 2 inhibitors, or SGLT2 inhibitors. Basically, what these are going to do is that normally when you have uh, blood being filtered at the glomerulus, you get a lot of um, you know, passive filtration of things like amino acids and glucose. Those typically get reabsorbed pretty well uh, in, the, in the proximal convoluted tubule, right? What we can do is actually block the reuptake of that glucose and then leave it in the renal tubule, and they'll just pee it right out. Okay, kind of makes sense, pretty straightforward. Um, can you see any potential downsides to this? What do we say likes sugar? Bacteria, also fungus likes bacteria, or fungus likes sugar as well. So we're gonna see there's some unique side effects with this one. But, um, so these are the newest group we have available. So these uh, are very uh, kind of goofy names to say, but we have canagliflozin, uh, dapagliflozin, and then impagliflozin. Uh, probably seen Invokana, probably used most frequently so far, but any of these are, are good options here. Um, but again, one of the things you're going to see is you're going to have a lot of increased sugar um, being released through the urine, um, and we can see that this will also help to lower body weight as well. Because again, if they're just eliminating that sugar, can't be absorbed into the tissues, you know, uh, it basically it's gone, and you lose those calories essentially. So the thing you're going to see is a urinary tract fungal infections, which again you don't typically think you think UTI you normally think bacteria, right? So again, you don't typically think uh, fungal infection. So if you had that history, they happen to be on Invokana, and then they go ahead and have a UTI symptoms, you need to be thinking fungus, right? So you need to think things like fluconazole, not something like, you know, um, uh, ceftriaxone or cephalosporin, right? Um, other things you can potentially see, uh, there's some issues with uh, bone resorption with canagliflozin, so you want to be careful with that for like, di uh, osteoporotic patients who have also have diabetes. Um, and there is some risk for diabetic ketoacidosis. So again, by depleting the body of too much of these sugars, not getting into the, the cells, you may find some issues where they kind of transition over to using fatty acid oxidation, and you can see that. They actually have a euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis, which is not normally what you'd expect to see. Like a DKA patient, you expect the sugar to be very elevated, right? So again, kind of an odd thing, but it's a risk you can see with these uh, drugs. Okay, so this is a good table to kind of reference back to when you're thinking like, what should I use for my patient? Um, and so this will basically tell you what the name of the drug is, what the efficacy in dropping the A1C is, the risk for hypoglycemia, the effects on weight gain, any other side effects that are unique to that class of drugs, and then the costs associated with it, right? I'm not going to quiz you on costs, but these other things are good um, points of, uh, of reference here. So again, metformin, Risk of um, uh, efficacy in dropping A1C, pretty good, right? So it has, has very good effects on in, uh, sensitizing the body to insulin. Very good at doing that. Um, the risk of causing hypoglycemia, based on the mechanism, you think, pretty low, right? It's not increasing insulin release. Um, so you have very low risk for, for hypoglycemia, which is a good thing. Um, effects on weight gain, either be neutral or may have a little bit of weight loss. Again, beneficial for your patients. And then we mentioned that GI effects and then the lactic acidosis. And what type of patients would you be more likely to see lactic acidosis? Yeah, uh, renal failure and, and potentially liver failure as well, but renal failure is the more common one we see. Good. And it's pretty low cost. It's old as dirt. It's been around forever, right? So again, most patients, you want to start out with metformin, okay? Now, if you had to add on something else, the question is like, well, what do I want to use? And really, a lot of it goes down to dealer's choice, uh, kind of what you like uh, for your patient, kind of what the patient is able to afford, kind of what um, you know side effects you're watching out for, things like that. So, for instance, you know, if I was using something like a sulfonylurea, very good at dropping A1C, but what is the risk for hypoglycemia? It's a lot better than it is met with metformin because I'm, what's my sulfonylurea doing? It's directly releasing insulin from the pancreas, right? So again, you'd expect that to be a potential side effect here. Um, and again, because it's increasing insulin, guess what? Weight gain is what you're going to end up seeing with that. And then the big side effects of hypoglycemia. So again, these are things to watch out for. Um, these are good things if I was asking a question, say, you know, for instance, I had a patient who was on metformin, A1C was still, you know, eight, and um, I wanted to start a new medication, but they have CHF. Which one would you want to avoid? And so you have to pick something like, you know, a TZD, right? 
you know, rosiglitazone, not going to be good for that patient. Versus if, say, I had someone who had a history of recurrent uh, UTIs, maybe SGL, SGLT2 uh, inhibitor is not going to be a good drug for them, right? Because they can increase their risk of having another UTI, fungal UTI. So these are little things to think about. So typically, any of these would work. You could add insulin on at this point. However, most people do not do so because, again, it's very cumbersome, a lot of education, a lot of risk for hypoglycemia, weight gain. So a lot of people don't like to start insulin at this point. Typically, what you're going to do is try to add on two combination drugs, usually either oral, or if you add on something like a GLP-1 receptor agonist, like a loraglutide or, or a xenotide. Um, at that point, uh, if it's still not working, you consider triple therapy, but this is where more, more likely you are to switch over to insulin. And so typically, for a type 2 diabetic patient, you had them on insulin and something like metformin, um, because again, these are going to have synergies in there, right? Because again, their main issue is insulin uh, uh, resistance, right? So if I can use like metformin plus a TZD plus insulin, we're going to get better effects in either one of those by themselves. So typically, you're going to find that most uh, type 2 diabetic patients will be on, when they get started on insulin, they'll just be on a basal insulin. So they'll usually be like on a long-acting form. You only have to give like one time a day, like giving Lantus or Levomir, just Q24 hours, so usually in the morning. Um, if they still are having trouble getting control, they can either add on, um, you know, change the dose, or they can add on something like mealtime insulin, right? So what type of insulin do you use for mealtimes? Ultra short acting or regular insulin, those are the most common ones, usually the short acting ones. Um, so something like, you know, a uh, uh, Humalog or Novolog or something. So again, fewer injections is what you're going to be shooting for the type 2 diabetic patient. The type 1, you can't really get around it. You're going to have to use, you know, basal and uh, mealtime insulin doses. Make sense? Okay. So any other questions on, uh, yes? So that's why you just left. We should really like kind of. That's very good information. Not only just for my test, but also like for for clinical practice, because you're like, well, you know, what do I do next? Because you know, diabetes is one of those things where it's like there a huge number of people get are affected by it, right? And so it's a huge market for drugs. If I can make a new drug that helps diabetic patients, guess what? I got a huge market to start with. Versus if I have a drug that I start for pediatric cancer much more of a niche market, right? So again, it's one of those things where this is like, has a lot of room for blockbuster drugs. And so that's why you see a lot of Me Too drugs that come out. So they say, hey man, Xenotide's a really good drug. It's dropping weight for people. They're using an off-label for this. I should come out with my own version of that. You get Liraglutide, you get, you know, Dulaglutide. You get all these, these kind of Me Too drugs. You see that with hypertension as well. Just like there's a million different ACE inhibitors, million different ARBs. You know, does any one of them work necessarily better than the others? No, but again, it's one of those things where, hey, there's a market for it and we can potentially make some money. Not to say that the whole pharma industry is all about money, but they're kind of beholden their shareholders, you know, just like uh, every other big company is. And so, again, uh, money is a motivating factor for a lot of them, right? And, of course, I had one, I had one student talking the other day. I was like, why are these drugs so expensive? Like, it just makes me mad looking at it. And, again, it can be pretty infuriating. Um, you know, part of it is is due to that kind of that cynicism of saying, like, hey, they're just looking at the bottom line. You know, anyone heard of Martin Screlly before? He's a, the pharma bro who got sent to jail for, you know, really jacking up. Like, those are the kind of the worst of the worst. There are probably still some good people out there, but again, a lot of the money has to go into, um, for every drug that comes out, there are tons and tons of chemicals that did not make it to that to market, right? So again, there's a lot of sunk costs with a lot of that stuff, so a lot of it goes back to R&D for new drugs in the future. So anyway, um, any questions on the endo stuff? Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, looking at <clears throat> last week's material, mm -hmm. um, the pre-mixed insulin and all of that, mm -hmm. concentrate, I can probably ask. When no, that's fine. Right. No. I just didn't understand what that was. Yeah, so the premix are usually mixing a short acting and a long acting together, so or intermediate acting. So it would be better for doing like maybe Q12 hour insulin dosing. So that way they get a short and an intermediate acting like in the morning and at nighttime, and then maybe they'll have like, you know, around uh, lunchtime, they'll have like a short acting insulin added on. Okay. <clears throat> we don't use them as much anymore. The goal is for was to um, try to get them to use fewer injections, but you find that the fewer injections you have, the more kind of um, – big swings in, in blood sugar you end up having, right? Um, so I can give, um, you know, ideally, if I can give insulin uh, through a subcutaneous pump 24 hours a day, you get very, very tight control of it, right? That's not good for everybody, but by giving fewer injections, you have kind of bigger swings. And so, you know, it's, kind of, it's a double-edged sword at that point. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, let's take a 10-minute break. We'll come back and then uh, start our OB guidance section.